So once we've got our line snapped, our clip set, our panels in place, uh, ready to go. Hey, welcome back to the channel, everybody. So I was cleaning up some stuff on hard drives and I found this video. This goes way back to like my first year of YouTube. So I remixed the audio as best I could. I want to post it because you can see how old I've gotten. <laughs> anyway, enjoy the video, everybody. We make sure that we tie all of our bar before we set any panels. Now, I know that that's different than a lot of people do it. It's just the way I was taught, it seems to work well as long as your verts are laid out so that they will not be where the snap ties go. That'll become more apparent as we go. Okay. <laughs> okay, guys, for those of you that do not believe in rebar tying guns, we have Ben here. This is only his second day. I have tied by hand for 25 years. I'm going to show that I'm faster than Ben. Shane, count it down. Five, four, three, two, one, go. <laughs> Finished. Okay, so before you turn that off, how many did you tie? I tied three. I tied more. He tied nine then. Did he tie nine? Yeah. Okay, so what we just proved is, is that the gun will pay for itself because Ben only makes three dollars an hour. Canadian, and, and I make less than I, uh, I make American dollars, so it's cheaper to have Ben tile the bar for the gun, <laughs> right? For yeah, sure. in Canada. Okay. So the point of that previous clip was to show that Ben, that was literally his second day on any job site, in the and with the rebar tying gun, he could be at least as fast is the most experienced. Now, obviously, I'm very slow at tying bar, in part because in 2014, we bought the Max Rebar Tying Gun. What we found is that with just two of us on site, is it greatly sped up one of the most tedious parts of forming a foundation, and that's the rebar. But the rebar is vitally important to the structure of that foundation in that house. Now, since then, we've taken on a number of very difficult foundations as just a two-person crew, in part because we had that rebar tying. It's a $2,000 investment, so it's not cheap, but if you treat it well, ours has never had an issue. For this clip, I actually lowered, I shot it on a GoPro at 240 frames per second, slowed it down to 5% of the speed. Now notice how fast it is in real time. Okay, a lot of questions on our forming system. This is very common here in the Pacific Northwest. What it relies on are two foot by eight foot MDO forms. They're two foot by eight foot long, inch and an eighth thick, they're a plywood product, very stiff, meaning that we stack them in two foot increments, either horizontally or vertically. So what holds them to the footing are spreader cleats. The panel sits right in there, like you can see this. So what I'm doing here on top is exactly the same as what's on the bottom. So we space them about every 16 inches typically. As Soon as we get to like six foot and above, then we space them about every 12 inches and at all panel seams. Now, when we stack panels, we use inch and five eighths snap ties. Here's how they work. They fit right in between the panels. The next panel fits here. And then what locks them together are wedges or shoes as we call them. They hold like this. As you drive them down, they tighten that panel. They pull everything in line and then they keep the concrete from blowing out the panels. Really, really simple system. So we just have hundreds of these these are consumable, they, get, they stay in the concrete. Then you either grind them, beat them off, or you just snap them off, snap ties. So the way it works, I don't have a piece of That would've been nice. Okay, so now when you're getting to taller than two foot walls, so up to about six feet, what we do is we stack the panels horizontally, like you can see over my shoulder on that side. <laughs> just a little easier. But once you get to about six feet and over, it's hard to go up the ladders with those two foot by eight foot panels. So when we get to eight foot and above, what we do is we put a row of either one foot rips or two foot rips, depending on how tall the wall is. In this case, it's 10 feet. So we run horizontally with a spreader cleat, every, every, about every foot, and then at all uh, panel edges, 
Then once that's done and we start stacking our panels vertically to give us 10 feet high, we find that it's easier for us to pick up the panel and set it on the wall than it is to put it on our arms and go up a ladder and set it. It goes a little faster for us, it's easier on the body, and then it strips a lot easier. The burk bar, you can just pop them right off and yank them off the wall. Now the spacing on the snap ties is one foot, two foot, four foot, six foot, and seven foot. We can skip two there in the middle. These two foot, uh, these inch and an eighth panels are more than strong enough for that two foot. We've done this for decades and it works. You definitely hear some creaking though as you pour, <laughs> which is always a little fun. And what we do at the top is that the negative with the two foot panels being stacked vertically is that your wall can kind of do this. So what we do is we keep a couple old eye joists in our boneyard and we screw every panel, every other panel, it all just depends on how the wall looks with Simpson Strong Tie SDWS. Three inch SDS, SDWS screws for the win. Nice big washer head, easy to strip and reuse. As we screw that in, it pulls that wall into a nice straight line. It'll still have a bit of a bow to it. So then we run a string, pull that wall to the line, and brace it. That takes almost no time at all. On the opposite side of that wall, we uh, screw angle brackets and set our aluminum, aluminum planks. If you're 24 foot long, you've got one 20 footer. So we're planked on the opposite side. So as we're pouring, we can bring that right to grade. We can hold our anchor bolts uh, secure so they don't tip over as you're pouring. And that's all there is to it. Then just, because you're not gonna sleep before the pour, go through and start adding cleats anywhere you think that they need them. Anything, the gap caused by this, your concrete's gonna plug itself as it's placed. So when you strip the forms, that little piece will break off. So yes, you're gonna see a line, but you're not gonna see concrete sticking out and your concrete's not gonna just start spilling out of the wall. Okay, so we use a uh, two inch line pump, I think. It's a lot cheaper for us. And then they run the hose typically for us. So, but the mix that I have to order for that is a 60-40, six sack, 60-40 mix. We've had this tested on two occasions and it was over 4,000 PSI at 27 days. No water was added. Here's how it flows. The, the aggregate is just a little smaller. Okay, so here's the 10 foot wall. What we're doing is we're pouring halfway up. So we're pouring in lifts. And then I've got trucks on 20 minute spacing. They'll just back up. This wall alone is a little over 10 yards. But the pump guy, we're not hearing any creaking from this. Pour in lifts, it's safer. So he's pouring to right about here. What I'm doing is keeping an eye on this inside. I'm listening for creaking. I'll holler if I hear anything that, that makes me uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. Very good. You are the man. That's what you can pull out. Yeah, there you go. Right over. You're doing, thank you. You're doing really Paul is not job. just a pump guy, nice with me. but he's an educator. That makes all the difference in the For the work that we do, this Makita cordless concrete vibrator works really well. It's especially important to vibrate that concrete around hardware, like those hold down straps. The tighter that your mix is or the more rebar that you have in a tight space, the more important it is to use a vibrator. So as the concrete is placed, it's placed semi-close to a snap line that we have in grade nails. So there what Kyle's doing is he's knocking down the rocks and then he'll use the back of his hand to kind of float that concrete to that line. And it, once all the concrete's placed, it's really time mentally to think about making your life easier to strip. So there I'm just scraping away the extra concrete that allows us to get tri bars underneath those panels. Now when it comes to stripping the foundation, notice I don't have a ladder. That's a 10 foot wall. 
But with that Burke bar, I'm able to just bend those snap ties over just enough to get the Burke bar behind it, pop it loose from the wall, and then in a nice controlled way, pull that panel off and stack it. I don't have to get on a ladder. There's no ballistic movements. Just nice and controlled. It's all about rhythm. The panel should come off that easily, by the way, in part because we really oil those with a product called JHA Strip. Works really well at preserving the panels and makes it a whole lot easier to strip. And then we stack them and we oil them as we go. Try to really bathe those panels in oil. The better that they're oiled, the longer that they're gonna last. Here's just a time lapse of taking that wall apart. All told, it took about two hours for four of us to strip all of these panels, scrape them, and oil them and clean up. Now it's not our job to do the waterproofing, but what I like to do is just go through and grind off those snap ties. There's a thousand different ways to do this, often because we're here just the next day or two days later. We found that the grinder works really well because it doesn't damage the concrete, it doesn't spin the snap ties in place but you might find that another technique works well. Here, of course, is our happy dance because we are done with the foundations cleaned up onto the next job. Thanks everybody for watching. Please like and subscribe. Remember, my goal is to retire as a hundred air and it's gonna take YouTube to help me realize that goal.